Hallelujah. Good to be in church tonight. Amen. Amen. And it's good to be the church tonight. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God's good to us, isn't he? Yes. Hallelujah. Well, I kind of feel at home when I come to Beacon. It's been a large part of my life here. Hallelujah. And it's good to come home. Praise God. Everybody good? Amen. You got the victory? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Is the power on? Is the power on? Oh. Yep. <laughs> Amen. It's tough to preach if the power's not on. Uh, <laughs> uh, Hallelujah. God's good, isn't he? Yeah. Amen. 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 Praise God. Are you happy? Yeah. Yeah. Look at somebody and tell them, I sure am happy. Back at him and ask if you convinced him. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God's just so good, isn't he? Isn't it wonderful to serve the Lord? Isn't it wonderful to walk with him and have him walk with us? It's an amazing thing to think that the creator of the universe loves you and loves me so much that he wants me to spend as much time with him every day as I can and as I will. It's never an imposition upon God for us to come to him and talk with him and be in his presence. Never. It's a sad thing to me <clears throat> when, I, when I hear how many uh, Christians, and, and most of them, or many of them, really uh, definitely Christians. There are a lot of people that say they're Christians, and basically what that means is they believe that Jesus was born and died and so on. But there's more to being a Christian than believing those things. It's a matter of being born again, having uh, a walk with Him. But, uh, but so many Christians do not understand that we can have a relationship with God, that we can actually know God, that we can have uh, that kind of a walk with God where His presence and His power are so manifested real in our lives that we can walk with Him and hear His voice and know Him, that we can come into His presence and, and when we come into His presence, He welcomes us there. And He welcomes us so much that He'll meet with us. I love the presence of God. I love the presence of God. Whether it's in times of worship and praise in church or whether it's time that uh, I'm in my, uh, in my prayer place and in my prayer time, uh, no matter what, no matter where, I love the presence of God. And I'm not the only one, am I? Yes. Amen? Yes. Just love to be in His presence. I want to uh, minister on uh, a subject tonight that um, I, I actually... There's a, there's a phrase around, a saying around, uh, that I want to really preach about tonight. And I'm going to tell you what it is, all right? Wait for it. Oh, wait for it. That's what I'm going to preach about. Wait for it. Amen. <laughs> you thought you were waiting for the title. That, that's it. Wait for it. I, I, I get a kick out of that where uh, sometimes, like, somebody will be showing you some kind of an experiment. And they say this is what's going to happen, and then and then they do what they're supposed to do, and nothing's happening, and they're saying, "Wait for it, wait for it." And then there it is. Well, um, interesting enough, that is a, a major word for believers. Wait for it. Amen. So let's get into it, okay? Uh, I can see already the anticipation of hearing more and more about this "wait for it" idea. Amen. <laughs> Did you ever hear uh, people say God always answers prayer? He answers it in one of three ways. Yeah. Either God says yes, God says no, or God says wait for it. Amen? Yeah. I, there's no verse for that. It's not anywhere in the word of God. I didn't what the Bible says. But there's a, there, there's a point of waiting that is very important for the believer. And that's what we want to get into. So I want you to, I want to bring a message on that subject tonight. What is it? Uh, you know the facts are, you can never be in a hurry to wait. Hurry up and wait. You know, you can't, you can't wait but one way. It takes everybody the same amount of time to wait. And waiting is just something that uh, is a normal part of life. Uh, waiting is a major part of faith. 
Uh, may, uh, waiting is a major part of financial harvest. We call it seed time and harvest. And I understand that uh, one way that you look at it is that there's a seed time, a time for sowing seed and a time for harvest. But put dashes in between those three words, seed, time, harvest. And that's the way it is in anything in the kingdom of God. There is a time of waiting for manifestation, a time of waiting uh, to receive what we desire and hunger after from God. Well, you got your, got your Bible with you, right? There's a lot of Bible uh, because that's what, we're, that's what we're talking is the word of God. Go with me to Amos chapter 9 and uh, verse number 13. Amos chapter 9 and verse number 13. Now, in this passage of Scripture, in this passage of Scripture, uh, it, it's given to us in where uh, the prophecy is coming forth from Amos the prophet about go, uh, the, the days of the tabernacle of David being restored. I don't have time to go into uh, that tabernacle of David, except that it's talking about uh, it, it's really talking about the, the New Testament, the day that we're living in, where once again, see when David, uh, this isn't the tabernacle of Moses, this is the tabernacle of David. Tabernacle of Moses was basically a tent. And we can picture it like a tent with all the sides up. They brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. Uh, you remember that story where uh, they tried to bring it once and they didn't do it right? And uh, the guy was struck dead, and so uh, David just left it at Obed-Edom's house. And then when David heard about the blessing going on at Obed-Edom's house because the ark was there, he went and got the ark and brought it on into Jerusalem and put it in a tent that he set up. And all of the sides of that tent, it was like it was a wide open tent. There's the ark of the covenant. And it didn't matter if you were a Gentile, you could come to the presence of God. Didn't matter if you were a man, you could come to the presence of God. And it didn't matter if you were a woman, you could come to the presence of God. Bible lets us know that under the new covenant, there's no difference, man or woman, Jew or Gentile. Uh, it, it doesn't matter, bond or free, doesn't matter. Red, yellow, black or white, it doesn't matter. We can all come into the presence of God. So he's prophesying about the tabernacle of David being restored. And then let's look and see what he says. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine, all the hills shall melt. Now, what does this have to do with waiting? Well, uh, I, I, want, I want to bring this to you right at the beginning of this message. I'm going to uh, talk some about the waiting in faith that we pray the prayer of faith and then we wait and believe God and uh, walk with God until we come to that point of the manifestation of what we prayed for but uh, I, I don't want to leave it so I'm talking about it right at the very beginning of this I don't want it to, to leave it where you pray about something and they think now I don't know how long it's going to have until this takes place, I don't know how long it's going to be till it comes to pass. Because the fact of the matter is, the closer we get to the end of time, the Bible is letting us know here in this prophecy, the shorter distance is going to be between the prayer of amen and there it is. So much so that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him that soweth seed and the mountains shall drop sweet wine and so on. It's talking about harvest coming and the harvest coming rapidly. Those who are sowing financially, it's going to be quicker that uh, and quicker as we get closer to the coming of the Lord that the harvest comes back again. Those that are, that are praying and believing God for uh, some victory of some kind, it's going to get closer and closer to the time that you pray and the manifestation comes. Here's a verse of scripture that I haven't preached on for years. A great verse of great importance in our walk with God. If uh, some of you here uh, were with us when I pastored here in Pekin, I'm sure that if you remember any of the sermons, you may well remember me preaching on Isaiah chapter 40 and starting to read at verse number 29. But as I was praying 
uh, God led me and directed me into this verse. And, and uh, <clears throat> these verses are, are really the text of what I'm going to be uh, ministering on tonight. It, it seems as though when I travel, um, I, I come to a place at home in my own walk with God and, and pastoring uh, our church there in Lexington where there are certain things that God begins to emphasize to me. Uh, emphasize uh, for me, for my walk with Him. Emphasize for the body of Christ. And then as I, as I travel and I see God, it, it's, it's rare for me not to be led to the very thing that He's been talking to me about. And that's a lot of what I'm going to be uh, dealing on tonight. In the last two nights, I have ministered on one of those areas. And one of those areas is uh, walking out our victory with a joy, keeping laughter in our lives, keeping joy in our lives. It's a bad thing when Christians get to the place where they're so serious and somber and sober all the time that they just walk around without any joy, without any laughter, and without any happiness. And uh, the Lord has really been uh, moving on my heart on that subject. And I've been preaching about it at home. And uh, as I came here, matter of fact, last night I was going to preach on something totally different. And when I got ready to uh, get ready to preach, it, it, it was just reversed on me where the Lord let me know that's not where you're going tonight. You're going back to this point about, about maintaining joy. But there's another area that's been extremely strong more than that in my personal life. And because of that, it isn't just for me personally, but it's for us as the body of Christ. And I've been preaching on it, ministering on it, and, uh, and, and, and pressing toward it more and more in my life. So we're going to, we're going to get to that uh, in this message tonight. Uh, verse number 29, Isaiah 40. He gives power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Did you ever get to that place where you felt like that? Where spiritually you had no more strength? Where spiritually you were just at a, at a place where... Uh, when, when I left here, God sent me to a church that... Um, I, I never believed in purgatory until I pastored there. And uh, I, I have pastored in, in purgatory. I mean, it, it's, it, it's not as close to heaven as some people think purgatory is. It was actually closer to hell. And uh, I, I pastored there for five years. It was, it was a, very, a very interesting and difficult thing. I, I could tell you stories, but I, it, there's no need for that. No doubt that God wanted me there. No doubt that God sent me there. And God made that very clear to me over and over again. I, I've been a person of prayer all my ministry. But I'm telling you what, I really became a person of prayer uh, while I was there. And I remember times that I was... Uh, uh, in the heat of the battle, when I, I felt so sorry for myself, it was ridiculous. I remember praying this on the way home from a uh, deacon's meeting. It was a deacon-possessed church. Uh, I, I, was, I was driving home from deacon's meeting, and uh, I had been beat up pretty bad. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was pretty, pretty, pretty bad. And I said, Lord, have somebody praying for me somewhere. Somewhere, Lord, have somebody praying for me. I, I just am too worn out and beat up to even pray about it myself. Isn't that pathetic? That was how I felt. Had I known then what God had in mind and what God was doing, I would have laughed at those board meetings. I would have laughed at everything that came against me because God had a plan, and you're part of that plan. We're all part of it. God had that in mind uh, from the day that he sent me to Kentucky on. Uh, he had that in mind. But there are those times where you get to that place where you feel like you've given everything. You've poured out your heart in your walk with God. Some people just quit. There is, excuse my English, but there ain't no quit in me. I wasn't about to quit. I, 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 I talked to the Lord about it, kind of like teasing him or something, but it didn't work. Um, but, but there's no quit. And I just felt at times that I was so exhausted with the battle. But uh, he said he gives power to the faint. And to them that have no might, uh, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord 
shall renew their strength. Glory to God. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. I love that. You know that word wait? I heard somebody preach on, on, it one, on that verse one time and just did a little bit different take on it. I don't really have a problem uh, with what they preached on, except that it's not really what it says. Uh, you know how you, uh, you go to the restaurant and uh, you have a waiter who waits on you? Well, they preached it in that direction. Those who, are, uh, those who wait upon the Lord, those who are the waiters who wait upon the Lord, you serve the Lord, they're going to receive their strength. But the word rate, wait here, the Hebrew word is to wait, to look for, to hope, to expect, to wait, or to look eagerly for, to lie and wait for, uh, to linger for. So it literally means what we talk about when we say just wait for it. Those that wait upon the Lord. Now waiting on God is mandatory in our lives if we're to find deliverance and victory in our lives. It's mandatory that we learn how to wait on God. Um, let's go to Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 25, and I'll give you a couple extra minutes to find that one because that's in that area of your Bible that's not too worn out. We don't read a lot out of Lamentations, do we? Lamentations 3.25 The Lord is good unto them that wait for Him, to the soul that seeketh Him, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. That word salvation uh, is a Hebrew word that means for deliverance, for help, for safety, for victory. So he's telling us it is good that a man should hope and quietly wait for the deliverance, the help, the victory from the Lord. So we wait upon the Lord for that. We trust Him and wait upon the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. Isn't it good to serve the Lord? Yes. Praise the Lord. Now, the first thing we I want to talk about is waiting in the presence of God, waiting upon Him. Um, when you're in the ministry, you're in people business. You never know for sure what what you're going to find uh, waiting for you around the corner and. Uh, I'm 76 and uh, I'm not worn out and I'm not ready to quit the ministry. I have, I have, I have no thought in the world of retirement. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've recently asked the Lord that the next 20 years are the most powerful, productive years of my life. And uh, that's what I'm anticipating and expecting. But very honestly, if I had stayed in the system of church life and the church government and so on, I probably would have retired about 10 years ago because it's not the way it's supposed to be in the body of Christ. It's not the way the church is to operate. Amen. But um, as, 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 we, as we are involved in, in the work of the Lord uh, and, and we seek how to do things by the kingdom of God, uh, let me talk to you a little bit about coming to Pekin. Um, I was pastoring in the Alton area, uh, the, the St. Louis area, Illinois side. I was pastoring in Wood River. And uh, the, the district superintendent was Brother Dorch. And Brother Dorch called me and he said, Brother Kelly, I want to talk to you about something. And I don't want you to tell me no until you prayed about it. Now, the church I was at had just built a brand new building. It was a, a very nice building. And uh, we'd see 550 people. We averaged attendance right, at, right around uh, 250. And uh, I, had just, uh, I had just bought new office equipment. They didn't even have an electric typewriter. And I, I bought a, print, a printing press. And uh, I had just really gotten a lot of things like that established. And he said, I don't want you to give me an answer until you pray about it. So... Um, I started praying about it and asking God what he would have me to do. Some of you that have lived in Pekin for a while, if you have been here a while, you remember when uh, that there's a triangle downtown where, uh, where I, I think the post office is right down there, isn't it? And our church was on that triangle. It had been built in 1889. Uh, there's an old house next to it that kind of leaned this way. They called it the Annex. That's where Sunday school classes and fellowship uh, area was. And uh, the church ran 
uh, right about 90 in average attendance. And I was going to leave a church of about 250, a brand new building, to come to a building that was built in, in the 1800s to 90 people. I, I, I don't want to sound bad, but the majority of those 90 uh, call themselves born again Christians, but they didn't, they didn't live like it. We actually, in the early days of my pastoring here, uh, they actually had fisticuffs in the front yard. And they weren't the world, they were the people from our church. We're out there fighting a hand-to-hand -hand combat. And it wasn't spiritual warfare. <laughs> and uh, so uh, my, my family lived in uh, the Moline area. And so I, I took a trip uh, just shortly after I talked to Brother Dorch, and we drove through Pekin, and we looked at the at the facility, and uh, I, uh, I thought this is, this would be the biggest step backwards I've ever made. Brother Dorch said, "I just feel something about this," and so um, uh, to to try to make a little longer story a little shorter, we I, I agreed to pray about it, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. And the thing is, it's hard to come to uh, a word of God when you have a lot of your own opinions and ideas floating around in your head. And, and, and that was the battle. But I wasn't going to do either direction until I got something from God. And I had, spent, I had spent days on end praying. And finally, I felt from the Lord, go ahead and go and feel out the land. So I called him up. I said, I'll come uh, and preach. And so I came and preached. And uh, when I got done preaching, they said, now we're going to have the business meeting after the, after the uh, sermon to see what the vote is, if, we, uh, if they vote to have you become the pastor. Um, I, was, I was not real sure yet what I, what I felt God wanted me to do. I said, look, you can go ahead and vote, but I can't tell you that I'll receive it if you vote me in. Not until I hear it from God. And so um, they voted, and they voted me in, and the deacon uh, called me up, and he was happy as could be, and he said, uh, we, just, we just voted you as our pastor. Uh, Brother Callahan, do you have an answer for us? And I said, no, but as soon as I get one, I will let you know. So we went to the hotel, and uh, we, we all crawled in bed, uh, I think there were just two of you then, weren't there? You and Thad? Was Sherry born by then? So we laid in bed that night and we started talking and, and uh, all of a sudden it dropped in my heart, this is what you're supposed to do, you're to come. So we lay there for probably a half an hour to an hour making jokes. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to go ahead and, and come here and be the pastor, but we're going to be secret about it because we're going to be doing a lot of peeking. And we may have a, a, a well, however many people we have in our conversation, we're going to keep track of them as we peek at them. And we just laughed about it. And I, I went ahead and called the deacon and said, we will come. And so I start talking to God. And I said, Lord, I'm going to go there and I'm going to prove two things, three things. I'm going to prove if a church could be built in this day on three things, prayer, fasting, and ministry of the word. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, in, in the church, we came uh, and, and fasting and prayer and the word. Those were the those were the chief things, the major things that we built the church on. I remember one time uh, I was asked by the district superintendent. They had a, a home a home uh, a, a pastors conference for uh, the the churches that were just starting, and uh, they, they said, "Brother Kelly, we want you to be one of the speakers for the conference." I said, I, I'm honored to do that, and I was. So I, as I prepared for it, I had one major thing to teach. And so my first session, I, I taught them that simple thing, that the church that we were building there that went from uh, 90, 89, or 90 to 1,000, two major building programs, television ministry, radio ministry, uh, all of those things that we had going on, and it was all done out of three things. Prayer, fasting, and the ministry of the word. And uh, after that session, we were walking to lunch, and the district superintendent walked by me, and he said, uh, Brother Callahan, uh, that was good, but that's not really what we're after. 
I said, uh, well, you told me that it was about how to get the church to grow, how to build a church. He said, yeah, but what we're wanting are the other things. You know, things like writing visitors letters to visitors or uh, visitation type things and so on. And I was going to deal with a little bit of that later, but those were the major things and they still are today. It's the, it's the major thing for us in our ministries. It's the major thing in our churches to be powerful is prayer and fasting and the ministry of the word. We stick with the word. We teach the word. We preach the word. And as we, as, we, as we have that relationship with God and learn the power and the secret of waiting upon the Lord, that's when the power and the anointing and the victory begins to set into our ministries and to our churches. And uh, I, I hadn't intended to share all of that, but uh, I, I felt like the Lord wanted me to do that. So that was, the, that was what we did here. That's what we built it on. I, I had... Um, I didn't have the Lord teach me how to spend time in prayer. I, I had gone through, uh, just before I moved here, I went through a period of time where uh, I had gone to a camp meeting at the uh, district campgrounds. And uh, while I was praying, uh, we had been called to the altar. While I was praying, the Lord said, I want you to go back and I want you to spend three hours a day in prayer every day for three months. And... Uh, I said, all right, Lord. And I was used to praying an hour a day. Amen. Uh, 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 the heat's winning. Let me, let me take this off. Hallelujah. Some people get cold a lot easier than I do. <clears throat> um, I have prayed an hour a day regularly. I believe, I believe that every pastor needs to pray at least an hour a day. And so... I have been doing that for quite some time, but three hours a day, but I did it. And, and in that time, I, I stretched myself. I, I expanded my ability to pray. I expanded my ability to hear from God. And God spoke to me and dealt with me. And I became stronger in the Lord, stronger in gifts, stronger in prayer during that period of time. I remember one day I was, I was in the church and I was walking, praying, walking, praying, just talking to the Lord. And all of a sudden, God spoke to me. And he said, I want you to go to North India as a missionary. I stopped dead in my tracks. I, I, I hit the front row, you know, like a, an altar. I, I, I just about fell in the front row because of all the places in the world that I had heard about that I didn't want to go to was North India, Calcutta. We had a missionary friend that came to minister for us, Wayne Francis, and when Wayne Francis would talk to us about the poverty and the conditions of Calcutta, that was the last thing in the world I ever wanted to do. And I, I laid there uh, uh, kneeling uh, on that uh, front bench and, uh, and praying and saying, Lord, I've committed myself. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And I had all these visions going through my mind about, uh, about uh, 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 you know, giving up the church and moving away from, from Pekin. And I, I had all these ideas going through my mind about taking my kids out of, out of school and uh, taking, they, taking them to India. And I had all these pictures about itinerating and traveling from church to church. And I was broken before the Lord. But I said, Lord, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. If that's what you want me to do, I'll go to India. And just as clear as he said to go, he said, no, I don't want you to go to India, but I want that kind of commitment and dedication here. I'd have never heard that from God. I'd have never made that level of commitment or dedication to God had I not had that time that I spent waiting on the Lord and pressing into Him and pressing into His presence. It's in the presence of God that He corrects us. It's in the presence of God that we get to know Him more. It's in the presence of God that we learn to hear His voice. It's in the presence of God. While well, we're there in the presence of God, waiting upon the Lord, that we grow in strength. Most of us, at one point or another, I, I know with uh, Pastor Bob that uh, he was for the time, uh, for a time in a denominational church. We we're taught to preach sermons. One thing about preaching a sermon, you can uh, you can buy sermon outlines. Uh, you can buy books that have a thousand outlines, a thousand or two thousand or whatever. 
And you can go through them and you can find, now that would be a nice one. I like that sermon. I could preach that outline. But when pastors learn the secret of waiting upon God, we're not preaching sermons. We're delivering messages. Amen. We're in the presence of God where we hear the voice of God and the heart of God. And from the heart of God, He brings a message to our hearts and we deliver it to the hearts of the people. Amen. Those are the messages that move people. Those are the messages that convict people. Those are the messages that make people happy. And those are the messages that make people mad. When you're preaching under an anointing, bring a word from God, it'll get deep down into the heart of somebody who's not living right, not doing right. And instead of receiving it, they can get mad because they're not going to change. But those that love Him, and those that are in the congregation who want what He wants, and want to walk where He walk, wants us to walk, and they want to hear from God, they're open to receive a message that's brought to us by somebody who's been in the presence of God, and here's a message from God. I pray this wherever I go. As a matter of fact, I'd already prayed it, but uh, we stayed out in the car for a few moments, Debbie and I, to pray. And I said once again, Lord, I'd rather stay home than be here if I don't make a difference. If I don't have a word from you, if I don't have what you want for us tonight, and if I don't make a difference, I'd be better off to stay home. And that's, that's the truth. That for, and for that reason, it's so important to hear the voice of God. And you only receive that and know that by waiting on the Lord. Amen. Well, uh, praise God. That got a gnat up here. Beelzebub sent him. You know, Beelzebub means God, uh, God of the flies, right? The first thing we have to consider then is, is this one about waiting in the presence of the Lord. It's one of the most important things in your life to build up, uh, to build up your life spiritually. I mentioned in the message last night toward the close of the message that we've had many giants in the pulpit. We've had men like Smith Wigglesworth and uh, we talk about the, those men, Kenneth Hagin, uh, uh, John Osteen, uh, not Joel, but his dad, John Osteen. Uh, giants in the pulpit. And it's time for giants in the pew. It's time for people to rise up out of the, out of the congregation to become giants serving God. Do you know that there is a network across the nation of, of uh, lay people who are street healers? I, uh, uh, several months ago, I kind of got into it a little bit by a, by a book that I read by a man that just called himself the praying medic. And that's all, the author of the book, The Praying Medic. And uh, he actually is a paramedic that works with ambulance. And um, it, it's nothing for him. He averages about five people a week that he sees healed. And he's not afraid of anything. The ambulance will pick people up. And uh, sometimes by the time they get to the hospital, they're healed. But he doesn't stop there. He goes out on the streets. If he sees whatever the situation, whatever the condition, you'll go to them and, uh, and pray for them. One of the guys that's in that nucleus of street healers has prayed for over 25,000 people to be healed out on the streets. The praying medic said that he averages four out of every five he prays for being totally healed. Whatever the problem, deafness, blindness, uh, they're crippled, whatever it is. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a last day revival where it's not a stay at home revival, where it's not a matter of, of the body of Christ uh, hiding out at home and, and going to church by, by uh, watching somebody on television. But if we're talking about a, a body of believers that rises up in this last day to the revival that we hear prophesied in this last day where your sons and your daughters will prophesy when the spirit of God is being poured out upon all flesh. When we're seeing revival in the land, unprecedented, like we've never seen before, like there has never been on the earth before. And where is it going to come from? It's going to come from believers who learn the secret of waiting upon the Lord. Where our major goals in our Christian walk with God isn't to get our prayer need met. But our prayer needs are met and our major goals are to take it to the world. And to see the lives of people changed and transformed. And how does it come? By waiting on the Lord. 
There are times that we get so caught up in the battles and the everyday busyness and we end up exhausted, both physically and spiritually. The answer is to draw aside and wait in the presence of the Lord. I have a book in my library. I've got a lot of books in my library and I've got one book that's still like new. Still got the jacket on it. Looks nice. And I've got it in the nice looking books section. And, I, and, and they're nice looking books in the nice looking books section because they're not worth reading. And this particular one is about burnout. And believe me, burnout is a major problem in the ministry. When I was pastoring here uh, in, in Pekin, the, the growth was coming and uh, the church was advancing and moving forward and I was busy night and day. I was busy all the time. Um, I, I, remember, I remember I'd go to the hospital visitation. Some would be in the hospital and I'd stand at their bedside talking to them and I'd think, you are so lucky. All you have to do is lay here. Even if it's hospital food, at least they bring you food. And I, you know, what kind of food did the ravens bring in to Elijah? So anyway, I said, I, I thought to myself, you're so lucky. It finally dawned on me that it was stupid to wish to be in the hospital to get some rest. And so I would just take, if I got to that place, I'd take some time out. But I got into spiritual burnout just a little bit. And you know how I identified, how I knew where I was? I got so tired of hearing me. Some people do that in about 15 minutes. Uh, hopefully, not, hopefully not too often. But I got tired of hearing me. I taught Sunday school. I preached three times a week. I taught classes. I taught Bible college in uh, Bloomington. I, I taught radio uh, uh, every day. I taught television. And I just got tired of hearing me. Why would you get tired of hearing you? Because you weren't getting things fresh from God. Brother Bergen uh, pastored in, um, oh, I can't, uh, one, of the, one of the towns here in the, in the metro. And uh, he, he said, Brother Callahan, I've got, I've got this uh, prophet. He's from India. And he said, I've never seen anybody like him. He said, this guy, I mean, you come and stand in front of him, he'll probably tell you what brand of underwear you're wearing. He, 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 I mean, he goes, he goes so deep into talking to you about you and about yourself. And uh, he said, if you can, make it over to one of the services. I said, well, Brother Bergen, I'll, I'll do my best to be there. And so uh, I worked it out one night. I went and his preaching was good. I really got a lot out of his message. Afterward, Brother Bergen came and said, let me introduce you. And so he took me back. And of course, this guy was Indian, spoke English in an Indian accent from India. And uh, uh, he, he introduced us, and I reached out my hand. He took a hold of my hand, and he looked me in the eyes, and he said, Callahan, brother, your problem is you're more involved in the work of the Lord than the Lord of the work. And it, it, was, like, it was like he hit me in the head with his sledgehammer. He nailed it. He was exactly right. I was putting everything else in front of, in front of my relationship of waiting on the Lord. And, and because of that, my, my physical body was being run down because now I'm doing the spiritual work without spiritual strength being like it should be. And when you do the work of God without your spirit being built up, it will wear your body out. And you'll find yourself exhausted and tired and discouraged and you'll go into spiritual burnout. And that's what happens to a lot of pastors. But fortunately, God... Put the pieces together that night i changed the, i changed my lifestyle and i started getting back into that uh, time of prayer stronger than ever before waiting on god seeking god and waiting in his presence there are just times where we get so caught up in the physical areas that we let the spiritual areas go when when god spoke to me that time and said three hours a day for three months every day uh, my first thought was, I don't know how I can work three hours a day. I'm already so busy, I can't keep up. I wasn't pastoring here, I was pastoring in Wood River. I, 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 I thought to myself, I don't know, but God's telling me to do it, I'm going to do it. And I agreed to do it. You know what happened when I took those three hours every day and gave them to God? I had more time left over than I had before 
when I use those three hours to do the other things, two of those hours to do the other things. You seek first the kingdom of God, the other things will be added to you. Amen? Go with me to Psalms chapter 27 and verse 13. Man, I'm not going to get through this message. I'm preaching a different message in it than what I had intended or what I thought. Psalms 27 verse 13. He says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. I fainted. I fainted other than wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. That makes it pretty clear, doesn't it? Let's go back to that text in uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Uh, notice that there are, there are four things that I want you to see that it tells us are the results of waiting on the Lord. First of all, they'll renew their strength. You will build yourself up both physical and, and spiritual strength as you learn that secret, that key of waiting upon the Lord. I, I've got some stories uh, that I've heard and stories that, uh, 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 you know, that I know of myself, but where people have been battling battles in their body, battling battles in their lives. Uh, when they finally took time, uh, there was a pastor that I know of that had prostate cancer, and it was diagnosed that he had prostate cancer. He took, uh, he took a, 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 I don't know how much, but he took a few gallons, I guess, of, of pure water and uh, shut himself, locked himself into his bedroom for three days of fasting and prayer and came out healed because he waited upon the Lord. And not only did he build relationships stronger, but in building the relationship stronger, you got to remember that the same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in your mortal body to quicken your mortal body. And when you wait upon the Lord, there's a strength that comes to you by the spirit that dwells in you. You're built up. You're made stronger in him by the spirit that dwells in you. And it says they'll renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. Um, I, I preached messages. Uh, I, I preached a sermon when I was here about eagles. I love eagles. Wouldn't want to get in a fight with one, but I love eagles. Eagles are probably uh, the most unique of God's creation in the animal kingdom. Uh, they have those hollow bones, huge wings. I mean, you see these little sparrows and uh, these other little birds, and they flap their wings and they work at it to fly around the place. Not an eagle. An eagle spreads its wings and catches the draft of the wind and soars on high. When it's storming down here, the eagle has the ability to fly above the storm. And they that wait upon the Lord have the ability to catch the wind of the Spirit and to begin to soar above the storm that's going on in their lives. That's where you keep the joy. That's where you keep the blessing because you're not down with the natural man. You're not down with the sparrows and with the chickens. You're, you're flying, you're soaring as an eagle above the storm. They that wait upon the Lord have that uniqueness that ability to fly above the storm. They that wait upon the Lord. I like they shall run and not be weary. Yeah. Running, running, it, it, it gives us a picture of, of somebody that, that it, it isn't just you have a vision, you're running with a vision. Somebody, you, you, could, you could put this into the business area. Somebody's got a vision of, of their business, of what it can be and what it can produce. And they don't just sleep in every day and, and come into the office late and, and go home early and just sit around and see what's happening in their business. They're running with it. And they that wait upon the Lord are able to run and not be weary. To run in the work of God. To run in the blessings of God. Amen. Amen. Let me give you some scriptures. 1 Corinthians 9.24 Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that you may be chosen. Psalms 18, verse 29. For by thee I have run through a troop, and by my God I have leaped over a wall. Doesn't sound like somebody that's under a shade tree trying to rest and relax for the day. It's somebody that's running. Somebody that's involved. 
Somebody that's fighting the good fight of faith. Somebody that's doing the work of God. Amen. Joel 2 7 says, They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march everyone in his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Hallelujah. Uh, that's the kind of church we want. That's the kind of ministry we want. We want believers that are waiting upon the Lord and coming out of that time of waiting upon the Lord where they can run through a troop, where they can jump over the wall. <clears throat> Amen. I have a little habit that I've done. I don't know how many of our churches do it. I don't tell them to do it. It's up to them. I just, I just do this myself. I never dismiss a service in prayer. When we're done, we go home. And the reason I don't is because I don't want people to feel, okay, well, we came to have a church service. That's over. Now let's go. I want people to have the feeling that this is just part of our walk. We come in as a part of our walk with God today. We come in here. We worship the Lord together. When we're done worshiping the Lord here, we're just going to go out and we're going to continue the walk with God today and continue to serve Him. It dawned on me a few months ago when the Lord was talking to me about this matter of being in the presence of the Lord and pressing into His presence that we do the same thing in our prayer lives. What's your prayer life like? Well, I pray a half hour every morning. So what do you do? I pray an hour every morning. So what do you do? Pray 15 minutes every morning. So what do you do? You go to your prayer place, wherever your prayer closet is, or your war room, and you go into your prayer place, and you've got a half an hour, and you do the half an hour of prayer, and when you're done, it's amen, and now you've had that time in. And now you go just like dismissing a service and going on to the next things of your life. Prayer isn't just one of the things of your life. Waiting upon the Lord is your life. Yes. Being in the presence of God is your life. And as we spend that time in the presence of the Lord, that's where we rise up to run. Let me uh, give you one more. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak. The vision that God has given us shall speak. We learn the secrets of running with the vision. Glory to God. And, and, and it will lie not. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come and will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And then there's one more part to this. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. When I think about walk and not faint, I think of soccer moms. You know, especially a soccer mom who's got a full-time job besides. Gets up in the morning after not having a, a long enough night's sleep and gets the lunch packed for the kids and uh, gets the husband out the door and the kids out to school or runs them and drops them off at school and, and then has to go to the work and, and get to work and get off of work and stop at the grocery store and come home and, uh, and then go out and run so-and-so to soccer practice and the other one to cheerleading and make the supper and eat the supper and clean up after the supper and do laundry and go to bed and get up the next day and, and do the same thing. That's that every day walking. The, the responsibilities, the jobs of the day, the work of the day, mundane, day in, day out, but they shall run and not be weary, and they'll walk and not faint. In other words, that time of waiting upon the Lord will strengthen and build you up so that just going through the responsibilities of your life doesn't tear you down, wear you out, and send you in to spiritual darkness. Amen? Amen. Let me read some scriptures there. Proverbs 3.21 My son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep, uh, uh, keep some wisdom and discretion. So shall, they, uh, so shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. You'll walk safely in that way. Isaiah 30.21 And thy ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, 
This is the way. Walk you in it. When you turn to the right hand and you turn to the left hand. In other words, that you'll hear that voice of God. How do, how do, because you've been waiting on the Lord. Ezekiel 20, 19. Uh, I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes. Walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them. Uh, um, it, it, you know, when, uh, when the towers were hit, it is amazing how many Christians were saved. And, and many not even not even going to work that day I, I heard the testimony of one they were uh, they were on their way to work and they worked in one of the towers and the I just struck them on the way to work that they just had to stop and pick up donuts for the rest of the employees and that little bit of time was enough that they missed the, the strike on the buildings we heard the testimony uh, on uh, Brother Copeland's program just a couple of weeks ago a woman talking about the fact that she was in the towers when they were struck and and uh, the, the Lord told her uh, turn here and go down that hallway and she turned there and went down that hallway and then the Lord said there was two directions and the smart direction would have been to go to the right and the Lord said uh, go the other direction and she went the other direction and to make the long story short she escaped uh, those areas where where the, the explosions were taking place and got out safely as well as a number of others who told her we knew that you were a Jesus freak so we just followed you <laughs> it's worthwhile to be the ones that wait upon the Lord Amen. now let me switch this and go just another another direction for a moment our walk of faith demands waiting how many times have we looked at the importance of, of waiting without stumbling or staggering when we're walking out of faith victory? Let's not be weary in well-doing, the Bible says. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And, and you know, it isn't enough that we don't faint. We, we can't stumble either. The Bible said that Abraham staggered not through unbelief you say well uh, I, I used to say this I, I thought that Hagar was at least a, a stagger but a Abraham Abraham didn't go into Hagar Abram did when it got to the place where God changed his name because of him uh, because he's catching on to the covenant he's catching on to the walk of faith God changed his name to Abraham and from that point on, there was no more staggering in his life. He was Abraham. And when Abraham came to that place, there was no staggering. That's when the pregnancy came. That's when the child was born. Because he staggered not through unbelief. And I'm telling you what, uh, we, we can't stagger. We've got we've to be strong and, and not be weary in well-doing. Amen. It's that place that the Bible talks about entering into our rest. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to take time to read out of Hebrews chapter 3, but starting there at verse number 7 through 12, he talks about entering into that rest, that, that place of peace where, uh, where, where your, your faith is strong and you're expecting and knowing and believing God. The victory is assured to us in God's word, but you've got to wait for it. See, it's, it's like this. Let me, let me start out here. Say, well, the Bible says the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. Question mark. Is there a question mark there in your Bible? There's no. There isn't any in mine either. So in other words, the Bible tells us if we pray the prayer of faith, you're going to have the answer to what you pray. Well, then the question is, how do I know if I pray the prayer of faith? According to what the Bible says, when you believe you received it, when you pray, you, you pray the prayer of faith. As long as you're praying uh, and, and your prayers are uh, that you're believing that someday, I don't know when, but God's going to do that. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. That's not it. As long as your prayer is, well, I've really touched God and I prayed and I poured out my God, my, pr my prayer to God. And, and uh, uh, you just watch and see one of these days. Uh -uh. No, you can watch and see for it to manifest. But you believe that you received it when you prayed. 
Do you know that everything that you can see came out of what you couldn't see? God didn't have anything in this natural realm when He started to create the earth and the, and the people on the earth. And out of nothing, He made everything. And as soon as you pray the prayer of faith, it's immediately done in heaven and you receive it. Pastor, I just don't know about that. I, I can't, I can't, I can't believe that. I cannot believe that I received something that I don't have. That is not the truth. How many of you, how many of you work with Amazon? Amazon Prime. I ordered some stuff yesterday. I'm not going to go to the store and look for it now. Because I got it. They sent me back an email and said, you got it. And it'll manifest. Some of it will manifest tomorrow. Some of it they said will manifest on Tuesday. God says it will manifest. He just doesn't tell you what day. Amen. And if you can trust Amazon, you can trust God. Amen. And when you pray, you believe that you received it when you pray and you shall have it. When you go on Amazon, you order it, and you believe you received it when you ordered it, and you shall have it. And it's the same thing, the same system. It has to come out of the spiritual realm into the physical realm, just like the creation did. And you just pray it and believe that you receive it, and wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Ah, there it is. You know, it's, isn't it funny how God does so many suddenlies? Uh, Wednesday nights, I'm preaching through the book of Acts and uh, having, having a lot of fun with it. The day of Pentecost came, and how did God announce it? Suddenly. Huh. 2,000 years. Uh, 2,000 years ago, but 4,000 years before that, basically it was prophesied. 4,000 years. We got scriptures in the Old Testament that talk about they'll speak with uh, they'll speak with their tongues. We've got it in the Word of God, and they waited and they waited and they waited, and on the day of Pentecost, suddenly there it was. Believe that you receive it, and from that point on, you know what I do. Um, they, they leave packages on our front porch. Our front porch uh, winds winds around, and over on this side. Uh, we have a little breakfast nook outside and, and they, they bring packages and they put them right out there. And so uh, the dining room is inside here and the stairway is there where I go up to, go up to my office. And I don't think I ever go up to my office when it's light out without going over it and looking out to see if we got a package. I'm not here yet. Doesn't bother me because it's on its way. Doesn't bother me because I've got it. And every day when you get up out of bed and, you've, and you believe you've received something, there isn't anything wrong with checking to make sure if it's here today or not. And if it's not here today, it doesn't matter. I believe I've received it. Wait for it. Wait for it without staggering. Wait for it. Wait for it without doubting. Wait for it. Wait for it without complaining. Wait for it. There it is. Are you getting it? Amen. Wait for it. The victory is assured to us in God's Word. Let's go to James chapter 1, verse 2. I, I probably am going to wrap it up right about here. Maybe I'll give you one more uh, scripture quick. James 1, 2. My brother, encountered all joy when you fall into divers or different kinds of, of temptations or battles. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. Patience is perseverance or persistence where you don't give up. It's not what we think of. The Greek word there uh, uh, is not a word that like we think of patience where you just kind of sit around. I'm patient. I'm waiting. It's, it's not that. It's perseverance where you, just, where you just keep pressing in for it. Let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like of the wave of the sea, 
uh, driven by the wind and tossed. And let not that man think that he'll receive anything of the Lord. Amen. So what is it telling us? It tells us that when you pray, wait for it and don't stagger. And it'll, and, and it'll come. Just uh, what we must wait for it, remember that we actually must understand that we received it when we prayed. Let's read those verses and I wrap it up here. Mark 11, 22. I love being able to use something like Amazon as an illustration. I, I try to be more health conscious than I've been in the past and I work at it. Um, so far I just, my job is just part time. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm working at it. And uh, what you put on your body can, can be a, a very serious thing health wise. And uh, uh, most deodorants are, are, are really not that good for your body. You, you absorb it through your, through your skin. And I, I found a, a deodorant that is made by this guy that uh, he's got a, it's a his, his story is a whole different story, but it's, it's a, a spray. And, uh, and it really works. And everything in it is healthy for you. And so um, I, I put out an order, I think it was yesterday or maybe the day before. Now with them, uh, I, I'm not sure when it'll come. He's not quick like Amazon. So it'll probably be five days, it could be 10 days. So, I'll, but I'll still be looking around the corner there as I go upstairs to see if the package is out there. But if it's not out there Tuesday, I'm not going to say, I'm going to call and complain. I'm going to tell them I've been waiting for this and I'm tired of waiting for it. Not to mention the fact that I need it. <laughs> no, I still have some left over. <laughs> rest, rest easy. But are you following me? And the same thing about our waiting on the Lord and our waiting on, on the answer to come. So Jesus uh, saith unto them, have faith in God. And literal translation, have the faith of God. Have faith like God's faith. And I don't have time to go into that. For verily I say to you that whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. And that's a major, major part of that. I preached on this before I ever left this city. I've been preaching on it ever since. What you say is what you get. So when you pray, then understand that you received it when you prayed and you don't talk any other way about whatever it was you asked God for. Therefore I said to you what things whoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive it. When you pray, believe that you received it. When you pray, believe that you receive it. When you pray. So when do you believe you receive it? When you pray. And what will happen? You shall have it. Let's stand together.